Hi everyone. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. Welcome to another Clay Studio Live. Um, hi. <laughs> it's Shannon. Uh, <laughs> here to talk to you guys about all things ceramics, and we'll see. We'll see what else comes up. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can say hi to me down in, in the chat, wherever that is. Oh, hi, Jay-Z. <laughs> um, yeah, and so like we have the last two weeks, I'm going to start by showing you guys something from my, my collection, uh, and then we'll get going with, with what we're going to do this week. So I have, uh, here, I, I just, so, hi, Allison, um, so, full confession, the reason I'm showing you this today is because I just used it. I was making, uh, bread this morning, and, well, I started making bread, like, yesterday morning, but <laughs> I cooked it today, I baked it today, um, and so I used, I was using this this morning, and that's why we're, I'm showing it to you now, because I was just using it. Uh, this is a Justin Rawshank, it's, I guess, a mixing bowl, because it has a, a spout and a handle, um, and there's a couple reasons I really like this bowl. For one thing, uh, the this white glaze is covering a terracotta, and y'all know I love me my terracotta. But he's kind of dragged the glaze in places so that the terracotta is sh is shining through more. The other thing I really love about this are the decals on it. Uh, you know, I just really like poppies. Um, the the original reason I actually got this was so that I could <laughs> study like the form and kind of live with it and see how it feels like this handle in relation to like how big it is and how much weight is in it when there's liquid in it. Um, I was kind of studying it so that I can steal this form <laughs> or make it into a form I want to I want to reproduce in my own practice, so that was, this is like, I, <laughs> I consider when I purchase things, um, like this, I consider it research, <laughs> which is how I get away from it, so I actually got this at the Clay Studio, too, I know we carry, I know we have, like, some of his vases and stuff, um, if you're, like, interested in, in these decals and stuff, I also really like he, when he does more, like, layering, um, and I used this so for bread this morning. The reason I was using this is I was cooking a sourdough loaf with a really crusty um, outer, like, exterior. Oh, hi, Karen, and hi, Megan. Thank you, Megan, for the Instagram ha handle. So you can check out um, Justin Roshing's work there um, on his Instagram. Uh, so, so the reason I needed this this morning is when you make a really crusty sourdough, this is just a pro tip, you need steam in the oven, uh, and so to do that I put a cake pan on the bottom most rack of my oven, uh, and I let that preheat with the oven, and then a minute before I put the sourdough in, I take this bowl full of water and dump a bunch of water into my, uh, <laughs> into my cake pan and that cr and close the oven and that creates a lot of steam then I cut the slits in the bread and then throw the bread into the oven um hi Katie <laughs> so also uh if anyone's making any bread or anything while we're all like socially isolated because you know you're home you have time to do it make bread and then tag the clay studio uh input which if you post it on on social media and if we have if anyone makes bread and tags us or any any baked good uh i'll i'll show it during the next live stream with your instagram handle so that's kind of like you know if you are interested um <laughs> go go ahead and do that <laughs> yeah it's a bonus cooking class too you know <laughs> we're gonna just turn this into like shannon teaches you how uh, or talks about ceramics to you and then teaches you how to make artisanal bread, uh, <laughs> which I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind. So, <laughs> so I kind of was at a loss of what to talk about today and then, and then Karen, um, recommended that maybe I talk about where some of my imagery for my work comes from. Hi, Dominique. Um, oh yeah, also, like, let's talk about clay and bread for, like, one second, though. I feel like there is such a connection between ceramicists, 
and also and also like bakers I mean there's like the obvious like a kiln in an oven situation and waiting a long time like you set something up and then you wait around for it to be ready to go on the next step <laughs> like drying clay or waiting for a dough to rise and then just like I mean you roll out cookies like you would roll out a slab uh, there's just like I feel like clay and baking are like best friends um <laughs> but but anywho, um, so Karen suggested I talked about like some where a lot of my imagery comes from. So I actually have with me my special guest joining me on the couch today is um <laughs> is the piece I made for this is for from the community show, so you might recognize it if you were in the gallery during the community show. Um there's you know, there's more to this on either side. I'll I'll rotate it. Just so you can, like, kind of see it. But most importantly, we're looking at this side because uh, this is based off of uh, Norse mythology. And it's based off of um, the cosmic... <laughs> the special guest wants to tip over and break. Um, it's based on the cosmic uh, the cosmic world tree called Yggdrasil. Um, that name translates to... Um, the first part of it, like Yigdra, is based on, um, it means terrible or translates to terrible, but it's also part of Odin's name, and, um, Drasil, I can't remember exactly what, what that translates to, but it's basically, like, Odin's tree. So, I mean, Odin is kind of like, <laughs> Odin is kind of like, uh, you know, so he's analogous if you're more, con if you're more familiar with Greek and Roman mythology, he's anal analogous to like Zeus or Jupiter in that he's kind of like the head honcho god of that um, pan pantheon, but he's also like super intellectual and a trickster too, so um, as you can see, once you get me starting, start talking about Norse mythology, I can really just like go down a, um, a rabbit hole, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm getting teased in the chat by Karen, um, so I'm just gonna, I wanted to share probably one of the more famous myths that, um, like, you, you've heard the word, um, a lot, and you probably are vaguely familiar with what it is about, um, and that is the, the myth of Ragnarok, because, and so if you know what Ragnarok is, it's, uh, it's the Vikings, or like the, um, the Old Norse, um, Fate of the Gods is what it translates to, and it's the destruction of, like, the, the world, I, it's like an apocalypse myth, essentially, but it, it does have, like, a twist ending that I thought was very, imp like, in interesting and, and important. Uh, during these times to bring up, so I am going to, I have like a, like kind of a, um, like an abridged version, so I'm not going to like read the prose edda at you because it is very dense and full of Old Norse and weird, um, translations into English that don't quite work, uh, culturally, so, <laughs> so I'm going with like an abridged version, but I think that this version, while not, um, capturing some of the, the, like, uh, interesting, like, nuances of, like, the original OG, like, prose edda, I think this does a really good job of, of summarizing this myth, so we're just gonna jump right into it, um, it also features Yggdrasil in it, there's actually no origin story for Yggdrasil, it just, like, comes up in a bunch of myths, but essentially, it's like the great tree that everyone lives on. Um, the star that I've put on top of it is kind of like a representation of um, Allison. <laughs> it it is light. It is light at the end. So we're just gonna get into it. But like sometimes you gotta suffer to like get to the good part. Okay. So <laughs> I'll also stop and explain some things along the way if you're not intimate with Norse mythology. <laughs> um, so, so we'll, we'll kind of go through this really quickly. All right, I'm just gonna, I'm also horrified about, like, the idea of reading, like, like, getting called on to read in class was always like, oh no, here we go. So this is great that I've just elected to do this for 
like the next 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to go for it. Alright, so this is called the Ragnarok, the Fate of the Gods, alright? Uh, someday, whenever the Norns, whose inscrutable spinners of fate, decree it, there shall come a great winter, unlike any other the world had yet seen. The biting winds will blow snows from all directions, and the warmth of the sun will fail, plunging the earth into unprecedented cold. This winter shall last for the length of three normal winters, with no summers in between. That is rough. Mankind will become so desperate for food and other necessities of life that all laws and morals will fade away, leaving only the bare struggle for survival. It will be an age of swords and axes. Brother will slay brother, father will slay son, and son will slay father. Keeping it light, Allison. The, <laughs> the wolves, Scully and Hati, who have hunted the sun and the moon through the sky since the beginning of time, will at last catch their prey. The stars, too, will disappear, leaving nothing but a black void in the heavens. Yggdrasil, the great tree that holds the cosmos together, will tremble and all the trees and even the mountains will fall to the ground. The chain that had been holding back the monstrous wolf Fenrir will snap, and the beast will run free. Gormungung, the mighty serpent who dwells at the bottom of the ocean and encircles the land, will rise from the depths, spilling the sea over all the earth as he makes landfall. This is where it gets really interesting. So the convulsions will shape the sh shake the ship Naglifar free from its moorings. This ship, which was made from the fingernails and toenails of dead men and women, will sail easily over the flooded earth. The crew will be an army of giants, the forces of chaos and destruction, and its captain will be none other than Loki, the traitor to the gods who will have broken free of the chains in which the gods had bound him. So Fenrir, with, blazing, with fire blazing from his eyes and nostrils, will run across the earth with his lower jaw on the ground and his upper jaw against the top of the sky, devouring everything in his path. Jormungand will spit his venom over all the world, poisoning the land, the water, and air alike. So they really do go for it with the, <laughs> with, with the like... Uh, the the scary imagery right off the bat. They're not messing around. So, the dome of the sky will be split, and from the crack shall emerge the fire giants from Muthlaheim. Their leader shall be Sert, with a flaming sword brighter than the sun in his hand. So, if you had watched Thor Ragnarok, you are familiar. We're talking about the giant fire guy at the end, so... Um, <laughs> it's funny how these things, like, pop up in pop culture. So they will march across the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge to Asgard. So, again, I mean, I'll just put this here so you can kind of see, like, that I, I do reference, like, a few, definitely reference a few things in this. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it'll get your mind off of, off of the situation, Allison, because this is... <laughs> the, you know, the, it could be, it could get worse. So, as they march across the Bifrost, the Rainbow Bridge to Asgard, the home of the gods, the bridge will break and fall behind them. An ominous horn blast will ring out. This will be Heimdall, the divine sentry, blowing the Galar horn to announce the arrival of the moment the gods had feared. Odin will anxiously consult the head of Mimir, the wisest of all beings, for counsel. Um... <laughs> we don't have to get, I don't think we have to get into what the head of Mimir is. Um, the gods will dec decide to go to battle even though they know that the prophecies have foretold concerning the outcome of this clash. They will arm themselves and meet their enemies at the battlefield of Virgin. Odin will fight Fenrir <laughs> and by his side will be the host of his chosen human warriors whom he had kept in Valhalla for just this moment. Odin and the champions of men will fight more valiantly than anyone has ever fought before, but it will not be enough. Fenrir will swallow Odin and his men. Then one of Odin's sons, Vidar, burning with rage, will charge the beast to avenge his father. One of his feet will be the shoe that was crafted for, for this very purpose. It has been made from all the scraps of leather that human shoemakers have ever discarded, and with it, Vidar will hold open his monstrous mouth. 
Then he will stab his sword into the wolf's throat, killing him. So, guys, this is... I think this is the first kind of scrap of, like, um... Of hope that we have in this this ho- seemingly hopeless stories, in that the scraps of leather that that humans have have thrown away, and that includes like discarding your shoes and stuff, will all become this one giant shoe, which is just absolutely wild. A giant shoe that will be used to defeat the monster a monstrous wolf in the end of the world. So, uh, you know, when you get a hole in your shoe, throw it out and get a new shoe so that you can help in the fight. <laughs> Another wolf, Garm, and the god Tyr will slay each other. Heimdall and Loki will do the same, putting the final end to the trickster, trickster's treachery, but costing the gods one of their best in the process. The god Freyr and the giant Surt will also be the end of each other. Thor and Gormengund, those age-old foes, will both finally have their chance to kill each other. Thor will succeed in felling the great snake with the blows of his hammer. But the serpent will have covered him in so much venom that he will not be able to stand for much longer. He will take nine paces before falling dead himself, adding to the blood of the already saturated soil of Vigrid. So, if you'd watched uh, Kill Bill, you would, you'd be intimate with the idea of someone getting struck and taking nine paces and, and dying. So, that's like a, a weird reference in that Quentin Tarantino film. <laughs> then the remains of the world will sink into the sea, and there will be nothing left but the void. Creation and all that has occurred s- since will be completely undone, as if it had never happened. But the earth will rise again out of the water, fair and green. The eagle will fly and catch fish under crags. Grains will ripen in fields that were never sown. So, you know, that's good. So, and <laughs> it doesn't stop there. <laughs> uh, Vidar and a few of the other gods, Vali, Baldur, and Hodor, uh, which, are, which are Odin's sons, and Thor's sons, Modi and Mangi, will survive the downfall of the old world and will live joyously in the new one. A, Lif and Lifheiser will two humans who have hidden themselves deep in the world tree will come out again and populate lush lands in which they find themselves. A new son, the daughter of the previous one, will rise in the sky, and all of this will be presided over a new almighty ruler. So, um with the rebirth of the world after Ragnarok will become a new golden age the Norse gods will return. Uh, so, so the thing about this myth is that it's like, like the destruction of the world, but also it restarts the cycle for the world, um, back to the, back to the beginning, um, where, it, like, where we start. So in the beginning of the Prose Edda, it kind of talks about how the, um, how the world was made, and if you want even more light reading, um, to, to tell, to talk, to read to your nieces, you should read about the creation of the world according to the Norses, because that involved, uh, taking a giant apart, like, killing a giant and then taking his body apart to create, like, the skull cap became the sky and stuff, so, hey, we could have went there, but, um, yeah, but it kind of creates, like, this cyclical, um, story where, where it's the ending, but it's also the beginning of something else, so, you know, I think, I don't know, I find that story both very interesting in a, in an imagery sense, and then also very interesting in kind of like a recurring, like a, 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 a myth that is supposed to be about destruction, but is also about creation or, or rebirth, so, um, so yeah, I think that's like the twist and ending of it, uh, so, I mean, when I read a, when I read stuff like that, I, it's a very vivid image for me, and I can I can very easily see uh, what's going on there, like in my in my mindscape. Um, and so I try to translate that into my ceramics a lot too. So in that myth, it mentions like the world tree and also the bee frost, which is what 
what this um this rainbow is um this right here is what i imagine mick like where mickgard would be it also references the circling of the snake um gormengund who is cir encircling and keeping the ocean in the like where it's supposed to be in the earth um and then this star is a representation of where where the gods are even down here it's not mentioned in that myth but the roots of Yggdrasil um create the the underworld where like people who don't go to Valhalla go when they they pass on so like I'm referencing that down there too um so I mean from that I, I there's like a lot of cool imagery that I think you could pull from that myth so the idea of like you know a giant astral wolf eating the the sun and the moon they don't it's not explicitly mentioned in there, but the, the concept of Ganunga Gap, um, a, a giant voidal chasm between, like, these different worlds, like, the world where, um, the frost giants live and people live and then the world where, like, the fire giants live, um, I mean, the idea of a rainbow bridge is so sick. <laughs> I love the idea that every time you see a, a rainbow, it's like, like an otherworldly being is just like coming in to say hi, like vacation. <laughs> um, and then also just the imagery of like the entire universe being contained in a in a tree. I think that's like really cool, personally. Oh, hi, Chuck. Chuck's Chuck's coming in with a smiley face to say hi. Um, so yeah, I mean that's so that's kind of where I get a lot of my imagery from and uh is from well not only really nice bedtime stories but also other folklore. <laughs> um so that would include like Celtic mythology or or like just like more less myth and more like folklore like um like the Baba Yaga, which is um a, a like a <laughs> a Russian witch that lives in a, a tree that has a house on the top of it, and the bottom of the tree is a chicken foot, and it like runs, it hops around. I think that's like so cool. <laughs> uh, I think that's like a really cool image, and maybe it's because I can't think of my own cool imagery. Is why I steal it from um myth and folklore and stuff like that uh, <laughs> but yeah so I'd love to hear your guys' opinions um maybe not about my ability to, to read for an audience but maybe about like um <laughs> either where you get your imagery from if you think that's like a good resource I don't know I don't know Uh, yeah, so, y'all are very quiet today. The other day, last time I did this, I had, like, Elaine Ingley was in the, <laughs> in the chat just, like, yelling at me to play something on my dulcimer, so maybe I should be, um, happy no one's, no one's yelling at me to do that. Um. So yeah, I mean, so also, why did I choose to read the story of Ragnarok to you guys, I guess? Um, well, I mean, because it certainly isn't what we're going through right now with the whole, the whole, um, the whole pandemic thing is a lot less, I, it could be worse, there could be fire giants burning down everything, it could be really cold. <laughs> Hi Leslie, yes, I know. I'm very academic. <laughs> um <laughs> Um and then uh but also I think that there's like a bright side to it at the end, which I think is like nice and hopeful. Can this be the Shannon compliment channel? I'm I'm not opposed. But preferably we would um we would like get to like like, I could help, like, you guys in whatever way, or, like, answer questions and stuff like that, um, 
But if you just want to sit and if you just want to sit and um, chat and compliment me for the rest of the time, I'm not opposed. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Le- Leslie asked, "What else am I doing?" <laughs> Cooking with clay. I haven't cooked with clay, although I do really want to try. Um, there's like a, a recipe. It's a um. It's called. <laughs> it's called um. Uh, like peasant chicken or something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's effectively you take like a whole chicken and you stuff it with herbs and stuff and like Chinese five spice is traditional and then you wrap it in a banana leaf and then you cover that whole thing with clay and you can like sculpt a very ornate chicken or something um and then cook it in the oven and it cooks and steams in that clay the one bad point to me is that you, you can't get a crispy skin that way at all like it would be a very one note meal so you'd have to make something crunchy on the side like like potatoes or something but anyway you um so it it cooks in the clay chicken and this is like very theatrical then you take it out of the um out of the (laughs) oven and at that point honestly I'd be painting that bad boy with some non-toxic paint or turning food coloring some way into paint um and then (laughs) and then uh and then you get all your all of your uh your guests together and you take like a hammer and you crack the chicken open in front of them and they all go whoa um (laughs) um so so I think that's right yeah it is a little like cooking a chicken in clay will be a little messing when you um when you pop it open but that's why you have the banana leaf is to protect the chicken and not get any clay on it so I mean it's like half performance half meal preparation which is probably why I like it um, alright, I'm just gonna keep going down, I'm trying to answer these questions in order, so Katie's asking me, do I keep a sketchbook practice? Yes, Katie, I do, I try to draw, like, something, um, every day, or work on drawings that I have been not finishing, <laughs> and, which there are a lot, so I actually did come prepared this, this stream and brought my sketchbook so I can show you a couple things. Um, this was something I made a while ago. Uh, if you were in the studio, you might have seen, I think Chuck has seen the bowls I made with this imagery on it. So there's like one big bowl that has the central gate and then some things, uh, um, some smaller bowls that continue the gate. Um, and yeah, I, I, I paint like on my ceramics in full color, but I only sketch in black and white. I'm not like using color when I'm drawing for whatever reason. Here's just a cute cat that doesn't have any bearing on anything. It's just like a cool cat. Um, and then I'm working on some some stuff that I'm thinking of making like kind of like a book or something. Um, this is written out by the way. This is English um, but it's just been the the alphabet letters that you're familiar with seeing have been replaced with um with other symbols so you could read it if you knew what symbol means what letter uh and then i have some like stuff kind of floating so this is kind of another uh thing i'm working on i showed this like a week ago uh and you can see i've added a lot of more dots to it (laughs) that's basically all i've done for that um trying to shade it. Chuck says that he loves the archaic letters. Uh, thanks! Yeah, I invented that. Like, they're my own symbols. So, thanks. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, Allison says that she loves the imagery and I make crazy stories pretty happy, actually. Thank you! I try to always see, like, the bright side of things any, anyway. Um, Oh, da-da. Karen asks if Punk or Wizard will be joining us today. Um, Punk is off camera sleeping right next to us and Wizard is on the um, on the counter. I don't know if I can get them to come over here, but I will try for you, Karen. Uh, <laughs> Leslie's asking what that what's that thing behind me? Uh, I need to know what thing because there are a lot of things behind me. If you're talking about my special guest, this is a piece that I had made for the community show and that we were talking about um so yeah uh yeah let's I never knew I was so academic uh yeah I <laughs> believe it or not um I play dumb a lot but I do actually read 
Um, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Allison asks, can I mix underglaze to color slip? And can I slip trail over greenware that was painted with underglaze? Um, um, so, Allison, could you mix underglaze to color slip? I don't see why not. I It would probably be a lot more pastel um, of a color when it comes out the other end. Um, and it would water down your slip probably, so you'd have to like wait for like thicken it up or something um and can you slip trail over greenware that was painted with underglaze that is a tough one i don't know how well that will work um because um only because i would be afraid of it like the slip peeling off um of the underglaze but it might work if the underglaze if it's like a black underglaze i wonder if it would flux like under it at all and pop it off uh, I think your best bet would to be to paint it with your underglaze, and then if you want a slip trail on top, I would carve, like, I, I would, like, scratch off the underglaze in those parts just to be safe. I don't, I'm not, I haven't really messed around with, like, mixing slip and underglaze together, so I don't know how that would work. Oh, Leslie is wondering what is behind my head. Uh, there's a Norfolk pine, which is the bigger tree. Um, and then this is just stuff on, like, my altar. This tall thing, if that's what you're talking about, is a bull's, uh, horn. Like, they shed their horns as they grow. Um, so it's that. Uh, and then that's a pothos. And then there's just, like, some stuff down there. Uh, who knows what it is. How late can I get my stuff in the studio? Leslie, I'm not sure when we're gonna be reopening, but I am sure that when we have a, like, a clear time and st and all in that procedure and all that I am sure that Karen will be emailing everyone about it so that's the secret the secret to um alright I really don't know what you're talking about I'm sorry Leslie <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I don't, I'm not 100% sure what looks like a bird behind me. Um, it could be, it, is it my leather jacket right here? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but just, if you're, so when we know what's, what's going on, um, Karen will email you for sure. Um. So I would just be, I would just constantly be reading Karen, at whatever emails Karen sends you, just keep reading them, because there's some good advice in there, and good resources. Have you, like, been, if you, have you guys been reading her, like, community resource, um, emails? Because there's some, like, sick links in there. <laughs> Um, yeah, does anyone else have, if you're, if you just came in, hi, um, if anyone else has any other questions, let me know, um, <laughs> either about the stuff behind me or what, uh, like, or ceramic questions, <laughs> um, has anyone, I have a question for everyone who's here. Has anyone tried making clay that's not, like, like making something other than clay? Because I have been considering trying to, like, um, I've been considering trying to make, like, clay out of, like, like a butter cookie dough kind of thing, like slab building with it to make cool stuff. Um, Leslie asks, is it worth buying watercolor set for the big bucks? Man, you have come to the wrong person to talk about co any colors on paper or canvas, because I'm really not that person. Um, I would assume that there's, like, you know, a, um, some kind of, like, correlation between, uh, like, price and quality, like, to a point, and that, like, 
and then it doesn't matter anymore. Um, like, I don't, I, I doubt that a $32 watercolor set is m much, like, like, that much inferior to, like, a $50 watercolor set. Um, yeah, but I, when I do, when I have used watercolors in the past, I prefer using the watercolored pencils so that I can kind of really selectively add a little bit of color and then blur it out a little bit, like a, st almost like a stain, um, but, but yeah, but like, and when that, I mean, I've had Faber Castle watercolor pencils and I've had Crayola ones and they've all worked the same, so. Also, I wonder how you could make, if you could make watercolors at home. You know, like, using, like, I don't know, coffee and stuff. I think that would be fun. Um, Megan says, oh, cool. So, Megan's making something out of, out of flour. Gonna make, like, try to make a slob cup demo. That should be cool. Oh, Karen, Karen coming in. Coming in clutch with a good answer to Leslie's watercolor question. Um, her husband uses a Pelican brand, so not, they're not sponsoring us, but <laughs> but there there you have it, folks. Pelican brand, a, allegedly good watercolors. Cool. So Leslie's gonna try to make some sculptural pieces with her with wood and her janky pieces. <laughs> oh, watercolor on clay? Okay, so now I can actually help you because I'm a big advocate for um, cold finishing. First of all, I think cold, if it's not supposed to be functional, why are you putting yourself to the torture of another glaze firing? Um... Uh, you know, like, I'm like, just, if it's like sculptural, like, why not, there's so many other finishes other than glossy glaze, and you can fake glossy glaze, too, if you, that's, that's what you really want in the world, um, but, yeah, watercolors on, I mean, I would not go and, like, get, like, super fancy watercolors for that, especially if you're just trying it out, uh, I think they look so sick on Bisqueware, because it, like, it sucks, off the water in a really nice way. I and also they're really fun to do like um to do with like if you go ahead and get yourself those water like some watercolor pencils, man, those are crazy. You just scribble, scribble, scribble and then you run a brush over it and it just transforms it. Uh I highly suggest doing watercolor on clay. Ooh, Katie says she has a recipe for making your own watercolors. Yeah, please send that to me. Um, and I, I will do some, I mean, I'll try it. I'll, I'll report back next week how it went. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. Okay, I'm finally understanding Leslie Levick's question. So, watercolor underglazes? So you can go ahead and make your own by getting a watercolor mold, you know, like, like for, let you put your refills in, and then <laughs> leaving the underglazes to dry out, they'll form their own water, so at a certain point it'll be kind of like a wet watercolor, and then after that, um, after that, they will harden into, a, like, a cake, and you can use them as a regular watercolor, a regular watercolor, like, a palette, you know, um, like a regular watercolor gray cake. Karen also suggests you can significantly water down underglazes, so that's another way to do it, but if you want that, like, dry, wet on dry, like, look, I think, um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a bad idea to um, a bad idea to make your own set of underglaze watercolors by, like, pouring them out and letting them dry. Um, I've done that, and I've also bought this set. The set was, like, fine. <laughs> but I think it's cheaper and, and just about as easy to just do it yourself, um, to make your own. Uh, how do you transfer pictures to clay? There's a couple different ways you could do that if you, um, have a steady hand and can trace 
Um, <laughs> and you can, and you can trace the picture, you know, well, you could kind of, like, screen print it on using, um, news, like, a newsprint to paint on a pic, like, a, paint a picture in underlays and then, like, transfer it over, and Emma, um, Emma Pylon is definitely the person to go to for that, because she's kind of the expert, even though she doesn't like me saying that, um, if, oh, you want to do a photo? So then you would want to, uh, you're looking to do a decal then. Um, so a decal would be, you know, so the way a decal works essentially is you have like a special kind of like, um, if you remember, like temporary tattoos, it's kind of like that paper that is then printed with underglaze, um, um, onto it. And then you would like, like, just like a temporary tattoo, essentially soak it in water and then apply the decal and smooth it out and fire it. Um, so we in the school don't have a way to do that. Um, like we're not firing decal firings, um, currently, but if you had a friend who was an associate, they could, they could, um, potentially help you. How do you know... Do you know how to hack a printer to print in underglaze or maybe wash? Uh, so the decal printer that we have is so, so, so sensitive. It's, um, that it, I mean, th that, uh, you have to, like, um, th it's so sensitive that it's kept in a humidity and temperature controlled, like, situation. It's got a cover on it when it's not being used. Oh, there's lizard. Wizard saying hi to everyone. Um, <laughs> so no, you cannot hack a printer to print in underglaze. I wouldn't really try. I don't think the results will be very good, and you'd have to be doing so many tests to do that. Um, um, Jay Z, Jennifer's willing. Sorry, uh, pointed out that you can print out anything on a printer that has lead in the ink. So yeah, you can print in black, um, with a, like an old inkjet printer, um, it has to, it does have to be an inkjet printer, but you can make like a sepia toned, um, a, like a sepia toned, uh, situation happen there, um, and yeah, so it'll come out like in different shades of, of orange, um, so you could, so you can print out a decal, it will have to be applied, I, bl I believe it has to get applied when it's greenware. Not believe it, yeah. Opa! Sorry. <laughs> so, um, I believe it has to be done when it's greenware. You would, like, print out in black and white, apply it, and then all the ink burns out and you're left with just... And I don't think it's lead, I think it's iron. Um, I think, I believe it's, an like, an iron oxide that's in the in the ink, um, cause lead would turn it white. Um, yeah, and the sepia tone you get from, from iron. Yeah, thank, Raymond coming in with the, it is iron. Thank you, Raymond. <laughs> um, Leslie says, wizard is so cute. Thank you very much. I know, that's how he gets away with everything. Uh, he's the an absolute terror. Every morning when I wake up, um, he, he whines at me until I feed him. Karen does have a good point. Um, if I'm not a hundred percent sure we can fire inkjet transfers in the school, so you would definitely want to check in. I think we have to check in with Corinne before we can just start doing that. Um, Um, so the, yeah, so Julia, the way the, the, um, the, the transfer works is that the, all the other, the other things in the ink burn out, and the iron oxide is the only thing left. Um, I believe I wouldn't take that also when you glaze it, I would low fire glaze it instead of trying to high fire it. Sorry. Sorry, um, Wizard is currently tearing up my couch. Give me one second. Alright, I'm back. Um.
So it looks like Raymond's got some kind of crazy... This is the cool thing about the clay studio, because Raymond's a graphic designer, but he also just, like, kind of knows everything. <laughs> so it looks like he's got a technique for making those, like, inkjet transfers work well. So I would talk to him um, when everything when we're back. I would just go find him, because he seems to know what's up. You can use the iron iron-ons uh, for t-shirts too. Oh, okay. Wow, this is getting crazy. So before we get like too far down that rabbit hole, I'll remind you guys that we can't actually do this or fire it unless we have approval from um, Corinne first. <laughs> Corinne is the the master of all kilns. Um, yeah. Any so any other ceramic questions? Until I get them, I'm just gonna tell you guys. Uh, what I, what I was, what I did yesterday, uh, <laughs> just to keep myself occupied, um, I started, like, an indoor garlic, uh, garlic growing system, uh, with an old fish tank that has, like, a glass lid, um, that I have for it that's, like, hinged so I can open it easily and water it, um, and, uh, so I just put, we, I had, cause I'm, like, really bad about, buying a lot of garlic and then not using it fast enough um so <laughs> so I had some garlic that turned green and was sprouting uh so I put threw that in there hopefully it works I also started seeds in the same container so hopefully it all sprouts and stuff um there's also bugs living in there which is really cool there's some like little isopods um that I saw crawling around in there yesterday. I didn't intentionally put them in there, I just found them. Hopefully I'm not horrifying off camera, my roommate is in the kitchen and hopefully they're not hearing that and just horrified that there are bugs in the living room. But to be fair, there have always been bugs in the living room. Um. <laughs> I'm good. Oh cool, Raymond's talking about images from a copier can act like a resist. That's cool. That's so like I'm learning stuff today, man. I came in here thinking I'm going to show you guys some stuff about North mythology and stuff and and talk about bread and now Raymond's on it. Uh Leslie asks, what are isopods? Isopods are the only um land-dwelling crustacean uh and they are a like a a family, so there's like a whole bunch of different species of isopods out in the world um you might be more familiar with their um their common names are pill bug or if you're on my side of the country growing up roly poly is what we called them um and so there's those little bugs that like if you poke them they curl up into a little ball and they look like they're like armored it's because they are and they're I they're called isopods um they're one, like tropical varieties the one that the ones that have hitched a ride into the soil um, that I put in this tank are the of a temperate variety because they're native to here. I wonder if they'll survive in there. Hopefully. Um, and they're they're like nature's little garbage men, one of many of nature's little garbage men. So they like they go and like they bury into the the su whatever substrate they're in, and they eat decaying organic matter. Uh, they so they continue the nitrogen cycle in this in the soil. So they're, they're, they eat, like, decomposed, um, bugs and, and wood and leaves or whatever, uh, and then they also, um, aerate the soil, because as they're digging, they're adding pockets for oxygen, so they're, like, kind of, they're pretty important for, like, like, forest biomes, for gardens and stuff. You'll usually find them, if you, like, like, take a, a dead leaf and flip it over real quick, you'll usually see a couple of them, like, scattering away. Um, they're also, like, under rocks a lot, uh, which I know because we used to get roly-polies as kids and, like, roll them, which is not the nicest thing, but hey, you know, when you're a kid, what you gonna do? But roll a bunch of roly-polies, so. Yeah, any other questions? Any other questions about bugs or ceramics <laughs> or Norse mythology? This has been a weird one. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I'm into it. 
I'll give you guys a second to catch up because I know there's like a lag between me and you guys right now, so. Uh, I also, so I also am like breeding isopods, not the temperate ones, uh, but I breed like tropical varieties of them. <laughs> so like if you, if you Google image clown isopod, they're pretty cool looking. Um, oh man, Chuck's asked me a really hard question. Who's made the, who made this mug? Um, uh, Mark? Mark something, I should know, it's mine and I own it. I already asked Dominique once. Um, that's the maker's mark, if anyone, if that means anything to anyone. Um, thank you, I <laughs> thank you Leslie, I do like this mug a lot. Um, I'm not 100%, if Dominique is still in the chat, she would know. Um, because, once again, I've already asked her, she told me, I, hmm, uh, Mark Berman? I don't know, she told me, and then I promptly forgot. Um, but I got that from the, the pottery sale, believe it or not. That, somebody, somebody like, a somebody <laughs> donated that mug. That had to have been, I don't think the artist did, I think that was from someone's, like, personal collection. Um, Mark Berman isn't right. Mark Arnold, there you go. I knew it was Mark. I knew it was a Mark. Yeah, so, okay, so that was a Mark Arnold. Um, yeah, I like his style. Aw, oh, Karen coming in clutch with the, the Instagram handle. Thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, I like it. It kind of looks to me like a... Almost like... It's both industrial and very, like, like it's got an industrial, riv like, riveting vibe to me, but then also it's got this, like, soft quilt quality, so I like that it's got some, like, tension um, in that. This is one of the few handles I can tolerate because I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the, um, of, like, the one finger handle, but this, this mug pulls it off because, A, the curve is perfect. In where, and the handle placement is, is perfect in a way that when you clutch it like this, it kind of just becomes a seat belt. And um, it's got a really nice smooth kind of transition there, so it's nice to hold like this. And when you hold it like this, because this is so, like, the connection, if you look how thick it gets right where it hits the, the cup, it's so thick that I it feels very much, like, supported. Like, I don't, I'm not afraid of it just, like, snapping off. Uh, on me, so I really, I think that is, like, another reason I like this handle. Also, my, I don't know, there's something really nice about this little thumb landing pad, how they did it. Um, yeah, this became, like, a, uh, this became, like, an impromptu, um, an impromptu, like, a critique, but there we go. Yeah, it is, so, Chuck, the, um, the surface is very dry. I'm not sure. I think it might be underglaze or it could be slip that was sanded or it could be underglaze that was sanded because it's, it's dry but also super smooth and it does contrast with this bare clay that is a little, um, a little rougher. So I'm not sure if that's slip or, or underglaze. Um, yeah, I'm not, I have no idea. Uh, Raymond... I see you. Oh yeah, so guys, give us your mug shots. I want to see pictures of y'all with your with your mugs, like, and then tag us on Facebook or Instagram so we can find you. Um, and yeah, I I certainly like seeing what everyone else drinks out of at home. Um, if it's your bonus points, if it's your own, that's that's sick. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, and then also, I said it at the beginning, I'll say it again, uh, if you made bread, if you're making bread at all this week, post it online and tag us so we can find it, because I would love to 
feature some of the the baked good creations from you all. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll also, my bread didn't turn out the way I was expecting it to because I unfortunately, this is like a total, I can't believe I forgot to cut s uh, slashes around the circumference of it and on the inner ring before I, um, <laughs> before I baked it. So it came out kind of weird. Like it, it spread out because it, it didn't have a way to release upwards. Um, but I'll take a picture of it. I'll take a picture of my bread shame and share it with you guys next week. Um, I'm also looking forward. I'll let you know how my watercolor experiments went. Uh, and that's, that's all I've got today. I can't believe I've been talking for like an, a whole hour. Maybe I should, <laughs> I should just start talking about my, like more of my stuff. Like, my mugs and stuff. Can't find bread flour anywhere. I'm almost out. Well, Chuck, guess what? I've never used bread flour. I always just use all-purpose flour. What's the point of having all-purpose flour if you can't use it for all purposes? That's my, that's my kind of, uh, that's my <laughs> way of thinking about it. Um, so, you know what? I can't find baking soda. <laughs> Someone mail me baking, like, baking soda if you got it. Don't actually do that. Um... <laughs> Shouldn't send, like, white powder in the mail, probably, <laughs> ever. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I've never used, sometimes, very rarely, uh, like, I have some wheat flour, so very rarely I will add wheat flour to, like, and sub, sub out some of my all-purpose flour, but I'm an all-purpose flour kind of person. I, I mean, my cakes and stuff. I use it for everything. I don't I don't believe in having five thousand different kinds of flour in your in your house. Um Allison says mail me <laughs> mail me yeast if even though that sounds insane. Allison, I have great news for you. There is yeast everywhere. Um, all over your body, uh on the counter your your you know, your stuff sits out on. Um on, on your bowls, probably, even, at, like, if you haven't immediately just washed them. So, if you need yeast, I suggest taking half a cup of water, like, warm to pretty hot water, mixing it with half a cup of flour, <laughs> and then mixing, mixing it up and letting it sit on your counter, cover it with, like, a cloth or something, I would suggest putting it on a little baking sheet or something in case it overflows, and wait until it gets bubbly, and there you go. You just made yourself a sourdough de starter that, um, and that's yeast, baby. So, like, you don't need, you don't, you don't need, I also am not a big fan of the commercial yeast. I do keep some to feed, <laughs> um, some of my animals eat the, eat yeast, so, like, I will put some every once in a while to fortify my goldfish's diet, or... I will also use it for other things. Um, all right, real quick before we end it, Leslie's asking, can you throw pots in a trash can to fire? Yeah, so you could. That would be like a like a raccoon kind of like a back backyard raccoon situation, or um, or also like there's like a that would be like a above ground pit firing kind of thing. There are. I've never done it that I've I mean I've raccoon fired with trash cans before but that re also requires having a burner in a, in a, in a, a raccoon kiln so um if you don't have access to that I mean you're basically at square one uh if you want to there are ways to pit fire with like very low fire clays um and you that like in a in a charcoal grill or you could adapt it for a trash can I'm sure make sure the trash can is not sitting on anything flammable or near anything flammable when you use that also, know that, um, if you make enough smoke, the firemen will come, and if, yeah, and, and Raymond points out, if you do not warn your neighbors you're gonna do it, they will call the firemen for you, um, so my, so if you wanted to do, like, a smoked, like, a pit fire kind of, um, pottery look, uh, you would want to have a low fire clay, um, burnish it well I would like with a smooth pebble or something or a marble or whatever but burnish it 
Um, you can apply Terra Sidge, as Raymond points out, too, especially if you don't need it if you don't have Grog in your clay, but not having Grog in your clay means it's more susceptible to thermal shock. But anyway, um, so yeah, make your pots, burnish them with, with or without Terra Sidge. Um, <laughs> um, and, or, and then you could, like, fire it in a trash can or whatever, but also know, like, if you're doing it that way, that's like a one fire, you're done. We also w don't recommend you do that, um, <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, also, if, if you, if you do something crazy like that, do not bring it into the studio and try to, like, glaze fire or anything. Also, if you burnish something, you shouldn't glaze fire anyway. Um, yeah, and that's not going in our kilns after you fire in a trash can. <laughs> Alright, you guys are getting rowdy in the chat. Um, so, I think that's gonna be it. <laughs> Julia, I just saw your, this conversation is getting so Italian. I guess you're talking about... <laughs> talking about, we were talking about bread. Um, Leslie, please do not burn down your house. Um, <laughs> uh, if you're getting bored, might I suggest, um reading some Norse myths because they are very dense and it will take you quite a long time to get through the prose edda so that should keep you entertained for a while <laughs> all right so that's gonna be it for me i'm gonna say bye to everyone i can see in the chat right now so bye chuck bye allison bye leslie bye julia bye raymond bye karen um bye who else is here um is that everyone? Oh, Jennifer's willing. Bye, Jennifer. Uh, who else is here? Bye, Megan. Bye, Katie. Uh, please send me that water under under underwater that uh watercolor recipe. Um, I think that's yeah. That's everyone I can see. So, oh, stop it! I love that we're still doing the compliment thing. I'm really into that. Uh, oh, bye, Marco. Hi, and bye, Marco. Uh, so, yeah, again, it was nice seeing you guys all. Uh, I'll be back next week uh, at 4 o'clock. We're going to have, like, a kid video up. So if you have any kids in your life, let them know <laughs> what's going on there. Um, I'll see you guys next week. Also, please tag us in your – tag the Clay Studio in your mug shots and also any bread shots you take this week. And we'll, I'll see you guys next week. Bye.